Chapter Five of Mary: A Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by April Gonzalez. Chapter Five. A few months after Mary was turned of seventeen, her brother was attacked by a violent fever and died before his father could reach the school. She was now an heiress, and her mother began to think of her consequence and did not call her the child. Proper masters were sent for and an extraordinary master procured to perfect her, in that most necessary of all accomplishments. A part of the estate she was to inherit has been litigated, and the heir upon the person who still carried on a chancery suit was only two years younger than our heroine. The fathers, in spite of the dispute, frequently met, and in order to settle it amicably, they one day over the bottle, as a means to quash it by marriage, and by uniting the two estates to preclude all farther inquiries to the merits of the different claims. While this important matter was settling, Mary was otherwise employed. Anne's mother's resources were failing, and the ghastly phantom, poverty, made hasty rise to catch them in his clutches. Anne had not fortitude enough to raise such accumulated misery, besides, the canker worm was lodged in her heart, and preyed on her health. She denied herself very little comfort that she would be no sacrifice in her person as well, absolutely necessary to alleviate bodily pains and support animal functions. There were many elegant amusements, and that she acquired a relish for, which might have taken her mind off from its most destructive bent. But these indigents would not allow her to enjoy, forced then, by way of relaxation, to play the tunes her lover admired, and handle the pencil he thought her to hold, and no wonder his image floated in her imagination, and that taste invigorated love. Poverty, and all this inelegant attendance, were in her mother's abode, and she, though a good sort of woman, was not calculated to banish by her trivial and interesting chat the delirium in which her daughter was lost. This ill-fated love had given a bewitching softness to her manners, a delicacy so truly feminine that a man of any feeling could not behold her without wishing to chase her sorrows away. She was timid and resolute, and rather fond of dissipation, grief only had power to make her reflect. In everything it was not a great, but a beautiful, or the pretty that caught her attention, and in composition, the polish of style and harmony of numbers interested her much more than the flights of genius or abstracted speculations. She often wondered at the books Mary chose, who, though she had a lively imagination, would frequently study authors, whose works were addressed to the understanding. This liking thought her to arrange her thoughts, and argue itself, even when under the influence of the most violent passions. Anne's misfortunes and ill-health were strong ties to bind Mary to her. She wished her continually to have a home to receive her in, that it drove every other desire out of her mind, and dwelling on tender schemes which compassion and friendship dictated, she longed most ardently to put them in practice. Fondly as she loved her friend, she did not forget her mother, whose chick line was imperceptible, that they were not aware of her approaching dissolution. The physician, however, observing the most alarming symptoms, her husband was apprised of her immediate danger, and then first mentioned to her his design with respect to his daughter. She approved of them. Mary was sent for. She was not at home. She had rambled to visit Anne, and found her in hysteric fit. The landlord of a little farm had sent his agent for the rent, which had long been due to him and he threatened to seize his stock that still remained, and churn them out, if they did not very shortly discharge the arrears. As his men made a private fortune by harassing the tenants of the person, to whom he was deputy, as it was to be expected from his forbearance. All this was told to Mary, and the mother added, she had many other creditors who would, in all probability, take the alarm, and snatch from them all that had been saved out of the wreck. I could bear all, she cried, but what will become of my children, of this child, pointing to the fainting Anne, whose constitution is already undermined by care and grief? Where will she go? Mary's heart ceased to beat while she asked the question. She attempted to speak, but an articulate sound died away. Before she had recovered herself, her father called himself to inquire for her, and desired her instantly to accompany him home. Engrossed by the scene of misery, she had been witness to. She had walked silently by his side when he roused her out of her reverie by telling her that in all likelihood her mother had not many hours to live, and before she could return him any answer, 
inform her that they had both determined to marry her to Charles, his friend's son, he added. The ceremony was to be performed directly, that her mother might be witness of it. For such a desire she had expressed with childish eagerness. Overwhelmed with this intelligence, Mary rolled her eyes about, then, with a vacant stare, fixed them on her father's face, but there were no longer sense to convey no ideas to the brain. As she drew near the house, she wanted presence of mind return. After the suspension of thought, a thousand darted into her mind, her dying mother, her friend's miserable situation, and an extreme horror at taking, at being forced to take such a hasty step. But she did not feel the disgust, the reluctance, which arises from a prior attachment. She loved Anne better than any one in the world. To snatch her from the very jaws of destruction, she would have encountered a lion, to have his friend constantly with her, to make her mind easy with respect to her family, would it not be so relative to bliss? For these thoughts she entered her mother's chamber, but then they fled at the sight of a dying parent. She went to her, took her hand, it feel the press hers. My child, said the languid mother, the words reached to her heart, she had seldom heard them pronounce it with accents denoting affection. My child, I have not always treated you with kindness. God forgive me, do you? Mary stood straight and disregarded scream. On her bosom the big drops fell, but did not relieve the fluttering tenant. I forgive you, said she, in a tone of astonishment. The clergyman came in to read the service for the sick, and afterwards the marriage ceremony was performed. Mary stood like a statue of despair, and pronounced the awful vow without thinking of it, and then ran to support her mother, who expired the same night in her arms. Her husband set off for the continent the same day, with a tutor, to finish his studies at one of the foreign universities. Anne was sent for to console her, not on account of the departure of a new relation, a boy she seldom took any notice of, but to reconcile her to her fate. Besides, it was necessary she should have a female companion, and there was not any maiden aunt in the family or cousin of the same class. End of chapter 5